we've been talking about worship and we've been saying worship uh, is total transfer of credit. Uh, it's total transfer of credit to the supreme source or the honor of all things. When we worship God, we are acknowledging God and we are saying, God, it's not because of what we have done, but it's what you have done. Uh, the money that I have in the bank is not my own money. You have provided, God. The life that I have, Lord, comes from you, God. The health that I have, I'm not able to go to the, to the doctors and I'm well. It's by your grace, God, and we worship God that way. So worship, it's constantly perpetual uh, uh, acknowledgement and giving credit to God and say, God, you are the God. You are the man um, to God. Amen, somebody. Amen. So is that perpetual awareness of what God is doing in our life? This is, this is from, from him, and you're constantly saying, this is from you, God. This is from you, God. This little thing I have is from you, God. And when you worship, people are supposed to be, to, to be fed up. They're supposed to get tired of you acknowledging him. Maybe when you do something to people, and they come and they want to say, well done for what you have done, and you point them direct to say, it is God who has done it. And so people are supposed to um, to get tired of you when you are a truly worshiper uh, people are supposed to be tired of you constantly giving God credit for what he's doing in your life amen uh, we came here today safe and then we drove some of us and some of us we walked and we are here and, and to just stop and say thank you you did watch over me along the way but we don't. We walk in here, we think that we are entitled. We think that we have made it happen ourselves. We think that, oh, maybe it's our good driving that has made us come here safely, or good walking. And an accident could have happened. You could have died. And yet God gave you grace today. Amen, somebody. And so he's worthy to be praised. For the cup of tea that you had this morning to just stop halfway and just say, God, I want to thank you for the mug that I have. And, and Lord, I want to thank you for the water that we have, clean water that we have, that runs into our homes and, and we are able to acquire water. Some have to go and get dirty water and they have to purify it themselves. But Lord, thank you that we have water in our homes and I'm able to have this cup of tea. Thank you, Lord, for the clay that made this mug. Thank you, Lord, because it came from you, God. Amen, somebody. Amen. But we don't. We think that, oh, it's my money that has bought it. I'm, I'm the one who is provided, and so we take it for granted. And we don't worship God with what we have. You know, the Bible says that, you know, you know, you know uh, the, he will keep you in perfect peace. He whose mind is stayed on him. When you have this perpetual worship of God, you are constantly realizing that it is from you, God. It is from you, God. Your mind is stayed on him, and he says you, he will keep you in perfect peace. We will serve the NHS. Lots of stress, you know, we go to, to the NHS for when we are stressed. Uh, maybe sometimes because our mind is stayed on God. We are, our mind is stayed on other things. But he says he will keep you in perfect peace. Now, last week we left it where I was asking the question, what qualifies God to be worshipped? What qualif Maybe just talk to the person next to you if you're happy to talk to them. Ask them this question, what qualifies God to be worshipped? Why should we worship God? Come on, talk to them. Find somebody and just say, hey. Yeah. Now, that's a strange question, isn't it? It is a strange question because we just assume that God should be worshipped. Uh, that's what we assume, that God should be worshipped. But God qualifies to be worshipped, and, and we are going to unpack that today. If, you, if your understanding of worship definition is correct, the definition of, of worship is correct that you have, worship is to give credit to the source of all things uh, that made it. You know, we're giving the source, uh, credit to the source of the thing that made it. Uh, so that's what qualifies God. And so what, does, what qualifies God? Come on, come on, come on. What qualifies God? Why is God worthy of you worshiping him? Why is he worthy? You, you, know, you, you, are, you know, you are only supposed to worship, you know, or you're only worshipful if you are worthy. 
if you are worthy, right? No human being is worshipful. No one deserves to be worshipped. Uh, none of us in here deserves to be worshipped. I, I, I know there are some that longs to be worshipped. They want people to bow before them. They want people to do. But nobody, not even the king in the land, is to be worshipped. There is only one who is worthy to receive worship and honor. But that's what we want to find out. Why is he worthy? Why is he worthy? You know, the mics that we were holding here, somebody made them. They didn't create them, but they make them. And, now, and, and, and so, uh, uh, you know, as beautiful the mics are, as, as amazing they are, and they're able, we are able to use them, but the person had to use somebody else's material to make something. Uh, but God creates. What does it mean to create? Create means to form from nothing. When you create something, you are starting something from nothing. And when you make something, you are making something from something. And there is only one who is able to create something. And that is God himself. The word that they use to create is that word asa. Uh, when you create something from nothing. And the word that they use to create, to make is bara, is when you are making something from someone. You can't take credit on something that's using someone else's material. Is that right? And so God is the creator of the universe, of everything there is. And he is the only one who is worthy of our praise, of our worship. He's the only one we can come and we can bow before him. Only God can make something out of nothing. Nobody else. Nobody else. Now, you, you can do something with it after he finishes making something. And so that's why it's amazing what people do. I was talking to someone. I'm sorry, some of you are going to find it upsetting. I was talking to someone um, just uh, on Friday, and they were saying to me, they're having to go through this process where... Uh, their eye, they have to inject in their eye. And my body just shivered. You know, I was like, oh, can you imagine an injection going in your eye? I didn't know there's such a thing that they're able to do that. But that's amazing what human beings can do. But it's amazing that how God created the eye. I got thinking about the mechanism of the eye, how God created it. Amen, somebody. Yeah. Oh, so here you are, you've made this thing beautiful, you know, you, you make it some, you make something beautiful, but you cannot take credit for it. So whatever that you have done, you can't take credit for it. Now, which means you can never take credit for those things that you have in your house because they're not yours. You use somebody else's material. Everything belongs to who? God, God the Lord, right? And the Lord means what? What does the Lord mean? honor right so the lord means honor he owns everything and is worthy of our praise now let's look at a revelation revelations you're only you worship you only worship the person who is worthy revelation this is what it says you are worthy you are what worthy right you are worthy being worshiped why are you worthy being worshiped oh lord what does lord means honor right now watch this this is this is loaded the angels right now they are shouting to him and they're saying you are worthy to receive you are worthy our honor and our god god means what what did we say god means the sustaining one right the self the, the sustaining one right so they're saying you are worthy the honor our honor the sustaining one, the one who sustains everything, and they continue to go in that one sentence, you find that God qualifies. They're saying you are the owner of everything and you sustain everything. In that one sentence, he qualifies. Just those three words, that's it. He says you are worthy because you own everything and you hold everything. You sustain everything. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. All things are made by him who made the universe. And he upholds it all together. He is worthy because he owns everything and everything was made by him and he sustains it. Amen, somebody. 
Oh, and, and therefore he made it and he keeps it. And, and uh, let's read again that part of, of Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Uh, the, the other part. Let's read it together. Uh, Revelation 4, 11. To receive the next slide, please. To receive glory and honor and power for you created all things. And by your will, they exist and were created. That verse is enough. Why is God worthy of our worship? He, cre worship. he created everything. And he holds everything in his hands. He qualifies to be worshipped. Now notice, God doesn't tell the angels to worship God. Uh, he doesn't tell them. I mean, once in a while, he, might, he would say, say it again. I love it. Say it again. He might tell them that, but the angels have a revelation of the one who sits on the throne. Even the elders, when they saw the one who sits on the throne, what did they do? They took off their crowns and they prostrate themselves. They bow before him because they had revelation of the one who sits on the throne. When you and I have revelation of the God we worship, of the God who created everything, of the God who holds everything, it should move us to worship. Now, we struggle to worship, maybe because we don't have that revelation. Imagine what would happen if you and I come in this place, or you and I in our cars, in our homes, we have revelation of the one who sits on the throne. We have revelation that everything we have comes from him. We have revelation that the whole universe was created by him. What would happen? How would we respond? You cannot have revelation of God or not God and fail to worship God. Remember, worship only happens when you know the God you are worshiping, right? It's impossible to worship that which you don't know. Amen, somebody. And so he says that you created everything. You are worthy to receive everything. You made us. And the angels, they are bowing. They are saying, wow, God, look at you. You made us. And then you made out everything else. You are worthy of being credited, God. You are worthy of me bowing before you, God. And so they are literally amazed and astonished. And they're like, wow, God, look at you. You, God, you did it all. And so I'm going to bow before, and they come, and they are bowing in their millions to God. Amen. Amen. When you create anything between you and God and, and give it worth, and that thing has become an idol, uh, whether it's your job, whatever it is, God wants nothing between him and his credit. He's worthy to receive all credit, amen, because he created it all. If you put anything between God and his credit, both you and the thing are in great danger. We do that. My job, my money, my house, my this, my car, my whatever it is. When you put, when you take credit that is not yours and you take it, you are in danger. You and the thing are in danger before God. Amen, somebody. Amen. And so, and, and God will destroy, destroy both of you. He hates idols. Tell the person next to you, God hates idols. God hates idols. And that might be a person. That might be your success. That might be your business. It might be some experience you had. It might be a project you created or a building that you built. Anything that comes between you and God and you take credit that is not yours, God says you are in danger. If your work becomes more important than the one who blessed you with the work and you take credit and you say, this is me, this is all me, God says you are in danger because you have now got an idol. Any idols in the house today? Whatever comes between you and God, God will destroy it and you because he wants all credit. Tell the person next to you, God wants all credit. And that qualifies God. Here's an example of people letting worship become an idol. You know, when the means becomes the end, when the means becomes the end, worship is lost. Everything is a means. The singing that we were doing is a means. And when that means becomes the end, then worship is lost. When it becomes more about us, when it becomes more about how we look, more about how we sound, when it becomes more about how will people receive it, then worship is lost. 
When the means becomes the end, then worship is lost. But we do so, isn't it? Uh, we know we are not supposed to worship songs, but we do worship songs. I like this song. Uh, I like this song, but the song is not really for you. Can I just say that one more time? When we are singing songs, if you happen to like the song, it's really not meant for you. I don't like this song. It's not for you. Just tell the person next to you that the songs are really not meant for you. Sometimes we are so busy focusing on the songs that actually we are more concerned about how we sound, how we look. And in the process, we miss the worship of God. And that's why I say worshiping God is difficult. And, and many times, wherever you go, you find yourself that it's actually about how we come across to people. Uh, it's about how we look, how we sound. And we have to sing these songs uh, that make us look cool. And, 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 and God is saying, worship is about me. Your songs have become idols. And so I will sit down. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna raise my hand. I don't like the song they're singing. I'm not gonna sing today because ah, oh, the songs were boring. They're not for us, but they're for God. Amen, somebody. So so uh, dancing before the Lord should never become more important than actually the God we are dancing to. Uh, if we are coming in here serving God, whether it's at the back, whether you're doing the welcome, should never become more important. My being a pastor should never become more important than worshiping God. I should first prioritize worshiping of God rather than seek to be loved by people. We have two people here and we worship the one living God. That's enough. Amen, Amen somebody. Amen. But we are caught up in a world where we are trying to entertain each other, where we are trying to please each other. And we want even churches that tell us what we want to hear. And God is saying, that's not worship. That's not worship. There should be nothing. Nothing should take the you know, credit of, uh, of anything. We, we don't own anything. So when you, you know, you, it's easy to become so preoccupied with how you, you look even in church. It's difficult. When we, when we come to church, uh, you know, the reason why we don't dance so much, I, I, I always say, you know, to God be the glory. And I was telling you about when I was in South Africa, and I was saying, God, my, my church, they don't dance. They don't like to dance. And God convicted me. He said, hey, when they have revelation, they will dance. When the time comes, they will, they will dance for God. So thank God that they can actually move, right? <laughs> So we thank God that we are able uh, 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 to move it and worship God. Most of our worship services are not worship services. I'm not saying just this church. I'm talking about the big C church. Most of what we call worship uh, services are not, well, yes, they are, but they are worshiping the service. We worship the service. That's why I, saw, I, I say worship is difficult. We come here because it's tough to separate the two. It's tough when you walk in here to be able to say, God, my mind is stayed on you. I'm going to worship you and you alone. It is difficult uh, because what, what do you mean when, when you are reacting? For example, right? We, we, come, we, we come maybe Monday, whatever day you react, and you come and you are preparing. What's actually going on in your mind? What, what's happening in your mind when you are preparing even to come and do something here. Uh, whether it's prayer, whether it's sermon, how am I going to come across to people? How am I going to be received by people? And the person that you are supposed to be singing about is left out. Uh, why do we react? Why, why do we react? And what's going on when we are reacting? Is it about God? Is, are we worshiping God? Can we react worship? Or is it that we come together and we worship God and we come on Sunday is just an overflow of something that we are doing throughout the whole week. Our life is a life of worship. Maybe we need to rechange the, the to change the names of what we call these things. Re worship reessa, worship practice. What are you practicing about? So, uh, Normally, we are thinking about other things. 
And so the rehearsal becomes the practice for idolatry. That's serious, isn't it? Because we're already preparing for the people rather than for God. Uh, how we come across um, uh, to people. Do you see how subtle that is? Now, sincerity cannot replace the direction of your worship. Uh, uh, you can be sincere and still not worship God. Uh, I, I'm just reflecting on, you know, when we come, some people come and they're more quiet and they're more withdrawn. You can be serious about what you're doing, but still not worship God. You can actually be serious here and do whatever you do, but still disconnected from the God you are trying to worship. You can sit quietly and everybody say, wow, you are, you, you are, you are really serious about God. But actually not. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1, Jesus is in a discussion with some, uh, some religious people. Let's just see what he says here. And it says that, Matthew 15, 1 to 2. Then the scribes and the Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now this was a worship act. The washing of hands was a worship act. They're not talking about hygiene here. Uh, those that do uh, hermeneutics know that when you read the Bible, you have, to do the, you have to look at it properly. And so they're not talking about hygiene here. They're talking about an act of worship. And so what they would do is whenever they come to eat, they would go under the water or have water run on their hands as an act of worship and they would wash their hands, and when they finished, they would not dry. They would just leave them to just, you know, drip dry. And until they are dry, then will they go and start eating. And, and the idea that was here, you know, uh, th this came from the, an old tradition from the time of Moses where God was giving them an example uh, of washing in water that came from the rock. And, and they were saying, and they were talking about keeping themselves pure. And, and, this, was a sign and, of, and this was a sign of saying, you are to keep yourself pure. So before they ate, they washed their hands. And so you put your hands under the water. And now these religious people, our religious people, they are complaining. They are saying uh, the disciples are not doing this anymore. You know, these were good Jewish people before you came, Jesus. And now you are here, Jesus. They have stopped doing all of these things. They are not even letting their hands dry. They are not washing them under uh, the holy water. They are just eating. In other words, the ritual became more important than the worship or the relationship with God. And we hear it in our churches today. Oh, we don't do this, they don't do that. We are caught up on the rituals rather than on the relationship. So here they are having this problem of religious worship. Look at his response. Look at Jesus' response. His response is amazing. It says Jesus replied. Let's read it together. Matthew chapter 15 verse 3. What does it say? Why do you... Let's read it together. Do you transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? He said he would rather for, you know, he said you would rather forget God and keep the tradition. You would rather just do something out of emotions rather than actually follow God. You are more committed to the program rather than the worship of the God to which the program is supposed to point to. And so they're caught up in the program. Matthew 15, verse, Matthew 15, verse 8. Let's read it together again, please. Chapter, same chapter. Jesus closes this discussion with this statement. What does he say? Verse together. 8. How, how, how do they worship? Let's hear. Let's continue. Verse 9. Is that possible? Is it really possible that we can come here and worship God and, wor and not worship God? Yes. Is it possible that we can come here and sing songs about God and bow and lift our hands and dance to God 24-7 and still worship in, worship in vain? Is that possible? Oh, we had a big service. We had amazing service and people were jumping up and down. It was packed and there was lots of people. But who was worshipped? 
Uh, it's a question we need to ask ourselves. You know, they were singing fantastic and, and everybody was up. It was amazing church, but was God worshipped? Did God receive the worship that is due to his name? In our carrying ourselves, in our meetings, in any place that we go, ask yourself this question today. Was God worshipped in your life today? As we have gone so far up to this point, we've been here together from 1030, was God worshipped in your life? Forget everybody else. Worship is difficult. Was the song to make you feel good or for God to have pleasure? Who was the songs for? Was a song so that we could dance up and down and jump and say we had a good service? Or was it for God? What would God say if you were to give us a review of our worship today? We'll give you a review of your worship today, my worship today. Would he say, well done, good and faithful servant? To say, yes, you really bowed before me. You adored me. You magnified me. You lifted my name up and you worshipped me in truth and in spirit. What would God say? That's the question. You have to help me here. I'm still asking myself this question. And I have this dilemma of asking myself, what is a bad song, a bad Christian song? When we come together, we sing songs and sometimes say, I don't like that song. What is a bad song? Ask yourself, think of, think, think of that. I'm not sure anymore. But I, 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 there's a school of thought out there, and I was just reading some things about that, and I'm still looking into that. And this, 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 this school of thought, they're saying babies, when they are born, I don't, I'm not, I don't necessarily agree with it, but I'm just going to share it. The babies, when they're born, they say, mother, you know, midwives, you have to tell me about this. They say babies are born ugly. Now, everybody's beautiful in God's eyes, right? But they say that babies, when they are born, they are ugly. Mama Faye, I, I, I'm not going to put you on the spot, but some of you have looked at some people and you think, oh, I don't know. <laughs> Are babies born ugly? Amazing. Let's say, okay, because it takes time. When a baby is freshly born, the blood is not actually started flowing much in their veins, and it takes time for it to start going everywhere, right? And, and so some, sometimes I remember my, I'm going to get in trouble, man. I remember somebody. <laughs> they came and the whole eyes were actually covered, right? Um, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, let's go back to the text. And, and you look and you say, and I'm told some, some of the, uh, the people, they say, whoa. But when you, when you give that baby to the mom or to the dad, what do they say? They say, oh, you're so beautiful, you're so beautiful, you're amazing, you're all this. They, you know, they are and, and the midwives, they're going, I think, hey. It's amazing, isn't it? And that baby grows up, goes to the playgroup, and that baby starts crying. The mother will know the voice of the baby. And the baby will start trying, and, and, and they just a few weeks, you know. I say, oh, say it again. You say, mama. You say, daddy. Right? To everybody else, it's, it's foolishness. It's like, I don't speak that language. It's like, that's just, just rubbish, right? It doesn't make sense. But to the mother and to the father, they say, wow, say it again. Whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, he says, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. When you and I come before God, I, I have had to pray standing to some of you. That's why some of you should sing in the shower. I've had to pray to say worship is difficult because how do you worship when you're standing to someone? You know, and I have to pray and say, God, help me to focus on you because they are singing. Right, they are singing actually, uh, and they are singing. Ah, yeah, nah. and, and they are oh, of course, but actually, God says, "Wow, say it again. Sing it to me one more time." It might be foolishness to them, but to me, it is. Wow, it's amazing. That's the God we worship. 
So I don't know what a bad song is. And I don't know that we, we, you should actually look at somebody. Don't, don't worry about them. And that's why we say sometimes you have to close your eyes. You have to focus on God. And the reason we are closing our eyes, it's difficult to worship God. Your eyes can be a, the greatest distraction you have in worship of God. Someone walks, walks in there and you are trying to, I love you, Lord. And you're like, oh, look what she's wearing. Or what, look what they're wearing. Or look what he's wearing, right? And you're singing, you know, you're singing, God, I love you. But you're, you're distracted by what's going on. And worship is difficult. But you have to put yourself in that place and say, the greatest worship takes place in the dark. In the dark. And that's why you find when people are going through stuff, those people, they will worship God like never before. And that's why we have to close our eyes sometimes when we are worshiped so that we are not distracted. You know, when I'm there, I'm closing my eyes most of the time. I don't want anyone to distract me. Because I look down, I'm like, God, I just want to focus on you, God. I don't want any distractions, right? Because it's difficult to worship God. Someone comes, excuse me, excuse me, and you're just looking. Someone just gets up. There are some people who just get up and uh, whatever is it, I'm not stopping you. But it becomes a distraction to the worship of God. It's tough to come here and be solely focused on God. So you can come here and be preoccupied with what's going on here. And you hear people say, I couldn't worship because I was looking around and I could see. Why were you looking around? Close your eyes and focus on God. Amen. Amen. So I don't know what a bad song is. God wants you to sing. The point I'm making here, I'm trying to make is when God says make a joyful noise to him, it might be noise to them. But praise to God. To Papa, it's music. Don't let anyone silence you. Don't let anyone stop you from worshiping God. Don't let anyone, you know, stop you. And, and don't, don't be a stumbling block for others. Allow everyone to worship God in however way they are gifted by God. Amen, somebody. It might be to you, but to God, it's worship, it's music. Amen. And we have to get to that stage. So sometimes your criticism is not worth a tin of beans. You know, even when these people are standing here, they're not singing to us. And sometimes they receive so much criticism. So much. I sometimes wonder, how do they keep going? How do they keep going? Oh, we don't like this. And we are not even pastoral, the way we talk about it. We just literally just nail it, crucify the, the Christians can be cruel, you know. But they're not singing to us, church. They're not here to entertain us. They are not here... They're here to help us. And, and so we, we should not be distracted by them, and they should not distract us. Amen, somebody. Amen. Oh, someone singing, the Lord, the Lord, ah, whatever. Their eyes are closed, and they're focused on God. Focus on God, and God is saying, wow, that's my daughter, that's my son, who's singing right there. And you sing to the best of your ability. And sometimes I'm more free as worshiping in the shower myself because I have no one and I have nothing to distract me. Worship the Lord. They worship me with their lips, but their hearts are preoccupied with what's happening in the congregation. They worship me with their lips, but they are distracted. Their heart is not there. That word heart has nothing to do with your chest. It has nothing to do. That word heart in this verse means mind and thoughts. They worship me with their lips, but their heart, their mind, their thoughts are not on me. And, and he said, you're making noise. You're making noise. Your mouth is moving. Your mind is not on me. You are worship. You are somewhere else. And God is saying, away with your worship. Away with your worship. Very difficult to worship God. And, and, and we have to come to that place, you know, where we actually just say, God, help me to silence all the distractions around me. I just closed my eyes, Lord. Help me to worship you and you alone. So don't take lightly closing your eyes. And when we say close your eyes, and even in worship, just close your eyes and, and you're saying, 
I don't want my eyes to become the greatest enemy in worship of God. I don't want to be distracted by that. But you keep worshiping God and giving him the credit that is due to his name. Look what he's wearing or what she's wearing. Look what you're supposed to be worshiping God. Worship God, worship God, worship God. Someone walks in, look at them, you look at them, and everybody's eyes go to them, and we are distracted. God is calling us to worship God again. He says that that's not worship when you are preoccupied with what's going on in the building. He says, I want you to be preoccupied with me. Worship me again. I don't want worship to be given to anything else. That becomes an idol. Not even the service, not even the song, but worship me again. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we, we, we repent, Lord. All of us, we find worship difficult. All of us, we get distracted, God. We get caught up in the song. We get caught up in how we sing. We get caught up in all sorts of things. And the reason why we came here is lost in the means. The means becomes the end. And worship is aborted. Forgive us, Lord, where we have met and gone through the rituals, the emotions, but have not actually worshipped you. Lord, we long to worship you wherever you are right now. If you want to just acknowledge God and worship God, why not just do that right now? Just join me and just worship God. We adore you, Father. We worship you for who you are. In our lives, Lord, we, we choose to worship you. We choose to make you the center of our worship, God. We offer ourselves to you, God. You are worthy of our praise. You are worthy of our honor, God. We credit everything to you, God. We transfer all the credit, God. Lord, you are the one who created it all. You are the one we adore in God. You are the one we honor, God. We worship and, and bow before your throne, God. Be high and lifted up, Father. Be exalted, God, in every area of our lives, O oh God. In our cars, God, may your name be lifted up, God. In our homes, in our jobs, may your name be lifted up, God. In our workplace, O oh God, in our businesses, O oh God. May you be number one, God. May we honor you. May we worship you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we praise your name, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. If there's anyone here today uh, that just want to respond or whatever it is that you sense God is saying to you, I'm going to invite the leaders and the prayer pastors to come at the front. And if you need to respond and just say, you know what, I've been thinking I'm worshiping God, but I'm realizing that maybe I need to adjust it. God, Holy Spirit, help me to be the worshiper that you want me to be. Help me to transfer all the credit back to God. Help me when I come here to remove all the distractions that come and I want to focus only on God when I'm worshiping God. Amen. Is there anybody here? Uh, the prayer pastors are here at the front. Just come uh, as we sing the next song. Next week, we'll be looking at the danger of worshiping worship. We'll be continuing looking at this, but we'll be looking at the danger of worshiping worship. Uh, and how that can easily creep in. But if you want to respond today, and you're saying, I, I want to walk right with God. I want to worship God. I want to worship him. And the Bible says that a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers, they will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. And that, those are the people that God is looking for. True worshippers. May we be true worshippers. May we be a people who are, who are worshipping God in spirit and in truth. In Jesus' name. That when we come together, we are not preoccupied with the means, but we are preoccupied with the one who sits on the throne. Amen. If you need to do business with God, just come to the front and we'll pray with you. Amen. Amen. Amen.